You're listening to Unfiltered with Muhammad, a podcast about personal growth and authentic leadership. If you're looking for tips on how to manage others, get ahead, and make your way up the corporate ladder, this is not the show for you. This podcast is about being of service to others, leading from the heart, and evolving into a better version of yourself. Each episode brings you motivated stories about unfiltered leadership and authentic leaders, those who involve others, use their influence to amplify diverse perspectives, and inspire teams to achieve collective results. If this sounds like you, keep listening. Hello and welcome to the Unfiltered Podcast and a huge warm welcome to my friend and my unfiltered guest, James Rosebush. Thank you so much for being on the show this afternoon, James. What an honor for me. Thank you for inviting me. Soon my listeners are going to understand why it's an honor for me to have you on the show because we're going to talk a bit about who you are, what you believe about leadership and servant leadership and how we can be of service to others. And I'm going to get part of your life story and what makes you who you are, what makes you tick and why you think it's important to be having the discussions that we need to have today. But before we go that deep, James, please tell my listeners, who are you? Well, now that's not fair. I thought that I was going to listen to you explaining who I am. It's not, it's not easy to talk about yourself, right? So uh, I'm just a person who's had an extraordinary amount of opportunity uh, to have met leaders uh, and people of all walks of life throughout the world through my years in the Reagan White House. I was a senior official working for President Reagan. I started his privatization program, which was his uh, favorite public policy, his domestic uh, public policy. And that led to uh, other countries mirroring that and copying that. Uh, It was really an effort to look for private sector solutions for public problems. So what we did is we looked for better ways to to create public housing, public education, public transportation, and public health by combining And at that time, it was the first time that we ever used this term public-private partnerships. So England, France, Germany, uh, and Italy followed suit and I was able to work with them as well. So that was an extraordinary opportunity for a kid who grew up near Detroit, which was, uh, uh, you know, which was a wonderful beginning for me. And I'll I'll talk about that a little bit later. But so I'll, I'll say just in summary that I stand at the intersection of public issues public policy and politics, and business and investments. So I, I'm just a businessman who had an extraordinary opportunity to work in the highest halls of government in the world with uh, one of the most respected and, and unusual and uh, capable leaders, President Ronald Reagan. Oh, wow. I don't get to hear that sort of introduction to a guest every day. So I'm glad to have you today and to sh- have you share with us your heart and your life and what makes you tick and what you believe makes the world tick. Because you know the world is sticking in a very different tune to a very different tune today, right? You know, where at the time of recording this, it's January, 2021. We're hoping that uh, 2020 was not uh, a trailer for 2021 or that 2021 won't be a sequel to um, 2020. We're hoping that we can create continue nurturing cultures where we all feel that we belong, inclusive cultures where, you know, we saw in 2020, the Black Lives Matter, the amplification of voices that have been silenced for far too long. We saw the spread of the pandemic from China to the entire world. We've seen it overcome us. We see people dying every day. It's really hard to remain positive and optimistic, but hearing you speak, hearing the timber in your voice, hearing the modesty in the way that you've introduced yourself. I'm going to ask you, and I usually leave this till the end of the podcast, but I think right now we need a bit of inspiration. What can you share from your expertise and and your experiences to help my listener, to help me figure out a way that we can just continue being more optimistic that 2020 is hopefully a better chapter for us to write together? Okay. Of course, I think about this probably 59 seconds of, of every minute myself. Uh, it's, it's been, it's a horrific time. There's tremendous stress. We've had complete failure of our education system, on and on and on. However, 
Let's take a pause and ask this question, which is what I ask every day of my life. What is really going on? Now, you have to recognize that the news media has one objective, and that is to sell advertising. They believe that, that to make their industry sustainable, they have to sell minutes to advertisers in order to pay their salaries and their uh, broadcast costs and that sort of thing. So they believe that the only way that they can sustain that is through finding or creating controversy. And controversy usually is bad stories. Now, alarming stories, things that will get you, they think to come back, oh, I've got, I've got to watch that newscast because they're going to tell me about this mm -hmm. building that burned down and 800 people, you know, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Now, that is not all that's going on. Because at this very moment, while people are dying from COVID, which is a tragedy beyond any, anyone can really either measure or sustain or, or deal with, there are 10 billion times more acts of goodness, her, heroic acts of goodness, of love, of care, and of also discovering new solutions every minute of every day. So whenever you get discouraged, and you think the world is dark, we're not going anywhere, there's a high suicide rate, I get it, I get it, but that isn't the predominant thing that's going on in the world. The media won't tell you this, but I can tell you right now as we sit here recording this wonderful podcast that people in my neighborhood are cooking meals for other people. They're mm -hmm. taking care of other people's children they may have to be in their own homes with their own families, but they're hugging and kissing their children. They're helping to educate them. They are earning, maybe it's a few dollars, maybe it's a few million dollars to help other people, to give it away. Philanthropy in the United States, uh, and I know in Canada too, is, is a national cultural tradition. And today we're looking more at the whole impact investing and, and impact philanthropy. You know, are we really doing the max we can? Secondly, we have more of a drive toward finding the answers to these problems than we ever had before. So you can say, yes, okay, this is a terrible thing that has happened with COVID. To, to be totally honest with you, I think it's something that's going to save civilization. Now, sad to say all these people have had to die because of it, but number one, it's going to save us by with, with these companies that have fast-tracked and now getting the government out of the way. I mean, wh why do we, the, e even the months it took to have these drugs, you know, qualified it, it is ridiculous. We, we should have had people working, you know, round the clock to get these things with, with the Department of Health, the CDC and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, these are advancing the medicines that are needed in the future, without question. Uh, number two, it's awakened the eyes of the people to China and China's uh, extreme and aggressive, threatening and accelerating reach throughout the world to dominate and, and to enslave all the peoples of the world in communism and to take away their freedoms. I believe that today, because of COVID, Com uh, countries, companies, and individuals are waking up to the fact that we must stop the published, well-published, well-documented, well-spoken initiative of the Communist Chinese Party to dominate the rest of the world. That means no freedom for anyone, no free economies, no democracy, no republics. All of that stuff will go away because China has already made in inroads uh, through their Belt and Road strategy to take all of these countries hostage through basically through lending and finance and infrastructure. Sort of and so I'm going to stop there, but I'm just going to say that I get as discouraged as anyone else. I do believe in divine providence, uh, as, as I think a majority of people do. But I always ask that question what is really going on? Is it the evil, the bad in the world that is predominant? It is not. It is not. There are a trillion times more good things happening right now as we're sitting here and having that conversation. And to, to get yourself through it, you must learn these stories and you must tell yourself this every day. And 
Lastly, you must tell yourself every day that you are here for a purpose. Every single, every single human being has a mission to play. You have, and I do a lot of coaching of the corporate CEOs and students and uh, you know, I call them wanderers, people who are just wandering on the face of the earth trying to figure out, you know, why am I here? I love to do this. And uh, I always, you know, not always start because it depends on the need of the individual, but we talk about, you know, what finding your true mission, because you were, it just didn't happen that you were born here at this time. You were born here at this time to do something, to contribute to the world. And the world is calling for you. Are you going to answer this call? I think we all need to say a resounding yes. You know, Viktor Frankl says it best. I mean, he's a Holocaust survivor. He chose to act and not be acted upon. And, you know, he said the greatest power that we have, and I, I paraphrase, is that we have the power of choice. We get to choose. And we, I mean, I hear you speak with such clarity, confidence, and conviction. And I think somebody with your background and the your expertise and what you've had the ability to see and just to remind the listeners you are in the midst of what was going on in, in the states in a couple a couple of weeks ago i think it was just last week with uh you know on the, on the 6th of january you you are in washington dc so you're in the midst of what happened in in the great states last week but i think you have the clarity to see beyond that neighborhood that you're talking about and you're choosing that yes you could see what happened on the Capitol, but you, you are also choosing to see the people who are helping others, who are making food and delivering them with social distancing, but helping others. You're choosing to see that if we focus just on the sensationalistic media that is telling us to tune in at eight in the morning, at three in the afternoon, six in the evening, at 11 o'clock at night, just to see who died, who's dying next, what horrible story they have to tell or one they'll, they'll come up with if they haven't won sensational enough, we get to choose how we interpret what's really happening in the world. And I think you, to your point, there's much more good happening that we need to start seeing than just the, the bad. And I, and I say that in very simplistic terms, good and bad, but there's a lot more that we can choose to see with clarity and embrace the good and embrace the good in each one of us but it's also the awareness. So you brought up the issue of China and I know I'm not gonna get into the whole conspiracy theories about COVID and how and where that came from. The reality is to your point, people are dying today. So we can't, we can't undervaluate the fact that this pandemic has caused businesses to, to shut down forever. And we've shut coffins on, on, on the lives of people who we treasure and close ones. And I've, had, I've lost people in, our, in my circles, but you know, you can still get up every day and recognize that these outdated models and paradigms that we've had need to be broken. And you don't get better until maybe you get worse. So I think you have to break into a million pieces before you can get better again. And maybe this is what we're doing globally is we're recognizing that enough is enough and we need to be more proactive in designing cultures where we're more awakened. Maybe you can help me in understanding from your global perspective and where you sit and what you've seen. How do we do that? How, how does you know, the ordinary person in their home shut in, you know, shut out from the external world? They only have access to their you know, social media and to you know, their television sets or wherever we get the news these days. How do we adopt a different perspective with more clarity? Well, first of all, I think we need to find examples and celebrate them. So I worked for the first president who brought every, every year we have a State of the Union speech, which I'm sure you're aware of. And at that speech, he wanted to bring heroes. So if you've ever watched this State of the Union speech, you know that, and now it's de rigueur for all presidents. So they, Ronald Reagan would choose maybe, oh, from half a dozen to 10 heroes that had done something spectacular that year. And so he would salute them and he'd have them stand up and he would tell their story. Now, this had two, I think, uh, it was valuable in two respects. First of all, 
it made him more inspired in giving his speech. Because I always say, and I, I train people on how to speak, as you know, you've seen my, my new bestsellers, winning your audience, right? So one of the most important things that you do as a speaker is that you're inspired yourself and in order to inspire others. So that added what I call glistening to his speech. But I will mm. tell you that listening uh, to these people and, and uh, actually at one time I was uh, putting together a, a new TV show called um, Everyday Heroes. And we were, sh sh we, were, we were looking for, and then we were gonna shoot these stories about these incredible heroes. You can find them everywhere. These are the firemen whether they're going out in a fire, they're sleeping down, they're waiting. Think about it. They're waiting to go into someone's house and save lives. Okay. So I'll never forget one year we had a we had an air airplane that went down in the Potomac River as it was taking off from a national airport in a snowstorm. And there was a guy. Now the river was almost solid ice, but it, it was absolutely icy cold. And that plane goes down and all these people stopped their car on the roadway because, and, and they walked, they got in the river. It, the river was like blocks of ice. They went on the, the wings of the aircraft. They went in, they pulled these people to safety. They saved all their lives with their bare hands. I mean, their whole body they, themselves, they were, you know, completely like frozen to death. Right. And on that state of the union, he brought some of these people in. And, and this, this is just has happened thousands of times, thousands of times over and over again, where ordinary people are willing to uh, to go in and to put their own life at risk. We see it day in and day out. Now, there's a little phrase I've always liked. Uh, only by serving will love grow. If you want more love in your life, if you want to feel more love, then serve. That's how you get, you get love given back to you. So all of these people that are doing heroic things, they, they don't do it out of choice. They do it because they feel a calling to do it. And, and they would say, well, of course, I, I couldn't not do it. I was just on the phone with a, a woman uh, who's, who's an old family friend who has spent uh, 25 years in the Middle East. She's a PhD in women's studies. She's fighting for women's equity in, and safety in the Middle East. And she is a light. She has a light about her. You would think that, and there are people that work on issues like this that get pretty discouraged and pretty serious. And of course, this woman is very serious about what she does. But she is full of love for other people and for what she, that is her main motivation. She's an, I've had her speak at some conferences that I, I've hosted. She has stories to tell like you've never heard before. I mean, she has gone into the fires herself to save people. She is a lifesaver person. And so I believe like Ronald Reagan, uh, the great president that I had this extraordinary honor of working for, that he believed that America, but I believe this is true for any freedom loving country, is a shining city on a hill. And he believed that this light must be kept burning. Why is that? You know, I had a woman, I was giving a speech one time in New York and this woman comes running up to me after. And I thought, oh no, you know, she, she didn't like my speech. She's gonna yell and scream at me, you know? And so I kind of darted into the green room, actually, to be honest, to get away from her, right? And finally she caught up with me and she's sobbing. She's sobbing and she said, I have to speak to you. I have to speak to you. I, I said, okay, well, you get this as a speaker, you know, a lot. So I said, oh, okay, yes. Okay, tell me. She said, Ronald Reagan saved my life. And I said, well, tell me about it. Because I, I had been talking about Ronald Reagan in this speech, right? And she said, I grew up in uh, the Soviet Union and I wanted to be, I wanted to be free. And she said, I got books that were put out by um, if, uh, Freedom Radio for Europe or something like that, you know, about freedom. And she said, I got these books and I would hold them to my chest and I would fall asleep 
And I would say, if I could only be free, if I could only get to a country like America, um, it would be like going to heaven. And she said, and, and I meant it. It, 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 it was true. I actually believed that America was heaven. So it's an unbelievable story. So she was a Reagan and uh, Gorbachev arranged at one time for a limited number of Soviet Jews to be to immigrate, immigrate. She had gone to Moscow University, where, where I have been myself, not, not as a student, but as a speaker. And she got a PhD in economics. So she gets invited to come. I think it was a very small number, like maybe 300 Soviet Jews or something like that got to come. She was in that. Her prayers were answered. She comes to New York. She doesn't even know she needs to get a driver's license. She buys a car. She says she's driving around. She got a job at Goldman Sachs, I think it was. In her first year, she was so highly skilled and, and praised, she made a million dollars. She said, I would no more have even imagined that a person like she's saying about herself. And she's, that is the story of what Ronald Reagan did for me. And I uh, published that story in an article I wrote in the Wall Street Journal called Reagan's Other Woman. And uh, it, it got a lot of attention, but that is just uh, an example of not only people doing good, but people seeking good and freedom right now. And these, these are the things that we're being called upon to do. And that is really what makes life worth living, I think, right? I, I mean, that story resonates more than you can imagine. As a young boy, seven years old, growing up in Beirut at the start of the Civil War, we'd sit around and wait for the gifts that my siblings who were already living in Canada would send over to us. So they'd send us clothes and we'd see these pictures of women wearing these stockings and they had blonde hair and which wasn't very common back then in Lebanon. Now everything's common in Lebanon, but it represented opportunity. It represented a different world. And we knew that Canada, so North America for us was a different world. It was a new beginning. It would be a new start. And at that time we didn't realize that we were going to come here. And I don't know who I would have been today or if I would have been alive, if I should not have had the opportunity, even as a refugee to leave Lebanon, go through Syria and Egypt and France and finally to Canada. But I would always see and for the longest time and even 44 years into it today, that novelty of being a new Canadian hasn't worn off on me. So I'm more Canadian than your average Joe here. I've tried to run into politics and become a member of parliament and might actually do that again. The Good. point is, you better believe it. The reason is that immigrant boy who came and embraced Canada as a new start, you know, Lebanon may have been my home, my, my birth mother, but Canada, you know, or Lebanon is my homeland, but this is my home and this is my adopted mother. And, you know, I don't weigh one more heavily than the other. They, they are both the sources of life for me. And I think, you know, Canada has given me, I want to be able to give back. But I think about that story of inspiration. And when you told it, it is incredibly inspiring, even the way that you shared it with me. Because it's like the moth that goes around the light and doesn't mm -hmm. see, right? And it gets burned by the light. You know, for those of us that see the light from a distance, and when we're coming from a place of darkness and we see that light, no matter how faint the flicker, we gravitate and we rush and we run and, and we want to get to that light because we see it as our only source of freedom. But for people who are always around that light, inundated with it, they don't value it like somebody so distant. So for that woman who went from being really enslaved and let's say, the, the, you know, the Russia of that time, she had her freedom and she was able to work hard and accomplish something of herself here, right? And we're not telling those stories. And even today in pandemic times and with everything that's going on, I think we need to focus on some of the happier stories because otherwise it's depressing as hell. You know, we, we can't continue just to talk about the, the 
things that are going wrong in this world. We need to be able to talk about the things that are going right. We need to focus on the things that can lift us. We need to lift others. We need to inspire others with stories and, and faith and hope. Because right now what we need most, we need hope. You know, and you know, things may not get better politically. They may not get better in terms of, you know, is there gonna be another strain of COVID? We know that it's mutating. But what can we do? We can change the way that we respond or react to, to what's going on. We can be these ancients and champions of hope and, and spreading some fraternal, right? Some sort of, we can find the humility in the humanity that we so desperately need today. Mm -hmm. How have you been yeah. able to, right? But how have you been able to keep this positive perspective? You know, you're an author, you've worked in the White House, you've met some very incredibly gifted and, and important people. How have you maintained this gift? Because you've seen some horrible things, I'm sure, in your life. But how have you maintained that light to be a, a beacon for you to help you get navigate and go anywhere that you want to? Because you have to accept the premise that every untoward, unsought, bad and evil thing that maybe happened to you is... I don't want to say exactly for a reason because it sounds trite, but it can be turned into mm. never miss the lesson of adversity. So uh, there's a little pamphlet I used to read when I was a kid. Well, I read it as an adult too, called The Truth About Adversity. And, you know, it's about the, the, the Bible story of, um, uh, you know, when he was thrown into prison he had Daniel? his coat taken away from him, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. You know, he gets to Egypt and he becomes Pharaoh's, you know, secretary of the treasury, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And he ends up saving his people. Oh, Joseph. Right? Joseph. Joseph. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So let, let, let me tell you, uh, when I was 19 years old, I went to work. I, I had extraordinary opportunities given to me very at a very early age. I mean, Yes, when I was 12, of course, I was doing lawn, mowing lawns and cleaning carpet. You know, I always had a business going, right? <laughs> okay, so Lebanese people are like that, right? So I wasn't selling rugs, but I, I was mowing lawns. Okay, so <laughs> when I was 19, 20 years old, <clears throat> I, I was offered a, an executive position in the family office of the founder of General Motors, the family office and foundation of the uh, founder of General Motors. So I had this extraordinary opportunity. The third week I was there, I was sitting at my desk in my office and I hear automatic machine gun fire going through the front, the glad, glad, plate glass front door of our office. We were taken hostage by six ski mask gunmen. Terrorists. This is in what city? In Flint, Michigan. This is what, in, in Michigan. Flint, Michigan. Yes. Okay. So they were uh, these terrorists and we didn't even know the word terrorist at that time. So they came to, um, abduct the head, uh, the son of the wealth creator, who was, you know, worth, okay, it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, but he was pushed into a room size safe and he was kept without harm. Meanwhile, the rest of us, we weren't valuable to the terrorists, but they were still terrorizing us. They were trying to kidnap us. We dove under our desk, right? I took my phone under my desk. I'm like, what is that? What is happening? And so it was scary. I, I don't mean to tell you. I mean, it was life threatening. I didn't know whether they were going to kill me or not. Right. So uh, about five hours later, the SWAT, the SWAT team had come and I guess they talked down the terrace and they arrested them and we got free. So three weeks later, follow this. This man who was thrown into the safe. He approached me. And he said, I would like you to start a strategic planning initiative for the staff and for the trustees to answer one question. Are we having impact through our investing and through our philanthropy? Now, this was at a time when the way I say it, impact was only a word used to describe a, 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 a head on collision between two vehicles. Now mm -hmm. we're talking about, is it having a social impact? Is it having an impact on this? Is that blah, 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 right? So little did I know, fast forward 10 years after that, I'm in the White House setting up the first office on impact investing and impact philanthropy. That adversity 
which took me, basically, you'd have to say it was a near-death experience. I mean, they could have just, these were automatic machine guns. They could have just mowed us all down. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think their intention was to kill anyone. But anyway, you're there in that situation, right? It's 10 years later, because of that, I mean, the White House, ha having the opportunity to influence and create good for millions of people, right? Not, not, you know, because of what we were doing. Also, to go, go back to that experience that I had in that office, uh, I think a couple of months after that, I was selected to be a Rotary International Scholar and they sent me to the Soviet Union. So I go to Moscow and to Leningrad and at an age of 20, 21 years old, I'm meeting with the heads of every Politburo agency. Go figure this out. You know, how this organization arranged for me to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with, you would say, the, you know, the head of housing, the head of the economy, the head of, you know, all these kinds of people. I would say they were four times my age and five times my girth. Because, you know, you can imagine these, you know, older Politburo people, right? And of course, I was followed by intelligence officers. I warranted a dossier, all that kind of stuff. So... When I come back, because I was chosen by Rotary International to be a scholar, they required me to give speeches. Now, my dad had given me three things. He was uh, an executive with General Motors. He taught me business. Number two, he was a teacher of Dale Carnegie speaking. So he taught me how to speak. Uh, and number three, he was a musician. And so I, he assumed that I would, I would adopt all of those things, which I have. So I come back from Rotary and I come back from this experience in the Soviet Union and I have to speak in front of all these audiences. And I'm like, well, I don't know about this. I learned, I stopped and I, I realized that what I had to, what I did have to contribute was stories. And what everyone wants to hear is stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, and this is what I teach, you know, with this third book, I just brought out winning your audience, people are hungering, you know, 75% of the world suffers from glossophobia, which is fear of spe speaking in public. We have a massive deficit in the ability of people to speak, even to their kids, let alone, you know, in public, you know, you, you're magnificent. You, you do a, a fantastic job speaking and, <laughs> and leading this podcast. <laughs> But I'm telling you that you're, you're in the minority. So I had to say to myself, the only way that I can stand up in front of these rotary clubs and make a speech is to tell stories. Well, I just told you two stories that I was able to retell mm -hmm. because of my experience in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and my experience of being taken hostage on that day. And that made the audience come alive and it, it took, tore down what I call the, the fourth wall of partition to your audience and it built a bridge. You always had to build a bridge to your audience so that your, your consciousness, those in the audience and yours can go back and forth over that bridge. Otherwise, you, if you don't create a connection to your audience, it's, you're, you know, your, your content is worthless. So um, why did I get off on that? I, I guess I was just telling, we were talking about how to turn evil in, in, into to good. So this, the truth about adversity, you could say, well, I, I had an adverse, I had an adversity situation there, a very life-threatening situation that was turned into good. And, uh, you know, we, we need to look for these opportunities. Uh, Ronald Reagan was brought up by an alcoholic father who he had to pick up off the ground and drag into his house. Uh, Reagan spent, you know, a lot of his youth up in, in, in a rented attic room, you know, reading books, trying to figure out who he was. And, you know, he suffered greatly from having that. But look, he, and, and when he graduated from college, well, he, he told me, and I spoke at this, there was a, he went to a Midwestern college called Eureka College in Illinois. And I went and spoke there, I guess it was two years ago, on the same platform where he gave his first speech. And he said to the, his dying day, he said his favorite speech he ever gave was the speech he gave in college to believe it or not, oust 
the president of the college. Can you see Reagan tried to do that? Uh, it to me, it doesn't. At that time, him. no connection that he would one day be a president. Yeah. So he says, I learned the power to motivate people that day, and I never forgot it. So that was what Reagan was always trying to do. And I, I think that uh, having that love for his audience and to recognize the power of communication gave him the ability then to go on and have an influence with millions of people around the globe. I mean, he could have left college and gone on, he was gonna go on to theology school and become a minister. No one, very few people know that. But instead he gets this job as a sportscaster and so forth, he goes on with his ability to speak. But he, you know, we can talk more about him, but. I'll, I'll stop there because I've been going on, but that's a little bit about, I, I think, turning adversity into, I believe wherever there's adversity, there's an opportunity. Well, and, and I, now I'm going to be the one to sound trite and I'm going to do that. Hey, it's my podcast, so I'm going to sound trite. But do I it. think, and here's why I believe that these are the little things that we choose not to see or to see. And where, you know, what I'm learning from our conversation is this is about perspective. It's about having this growth mindset and why it's so important in leading ourselves so we can lead others. But I'm not going to even go down that tangent. I'm going to go down the tangent that you've led me on, which is it is perspective. You could have, well, first of all, I'm going to use the word God, okay? God had chosen for you not to become a victim in that heist. You know, you fortunately were not hurt and other people were not hurt from what I understood. But your outlook, the way that you interpreted what happened to you, reminds me of something that I read in the Quran. So God created life and death to test you, to see who is the best in action. Is this not what you explained for 10 minutes? You have told me that we could choose to see adversity as something that is bad, it's happened to us, woe is me, look at me, I am, this is so overwhelming, I'm a victim, or we can choose to see adversity as a ladder from where we climb, from the darkness of our caves, lift ourselves up, see the light, become the light for others, shine the light on others, show them that there is hope, and do good. And so we have that choice, and you know, I, that sounds a bit trite, but I think we have that power to choose and to choose to do good for others. And, you know, I think the reason that you're so enamored with, with, with your relationship with, with uh, the late president is because you were able to see how he made consecutive and ongoing choices to do good things and to be better things. And we can do that every day. I don't have to become the president of the United States. I don't have to make an impact on more than one person. I can choose to do that for one person in my family. Or, you know, when I spoke at TED a few years ago, it gave me the opportunity to reach out to a wide audience and to share a message about Islamophobia and reclaiming my name. My hope was for people to walk away with a different mindset, for people to open the door and understand how different are you and I? I mean, no, we're not. Shakespeare's we're not. not. You know, if you prick us, do we not bleed? Shakespeare would it encourage us to, to ponder over that you and I are not that different. And today, we're, you know, when we're facing, you know, the us versus them, you know, we're talking about maybe what just happened recently in the States or what's been happening. You know, this may be a relevant story today, but those sort of stories have been happening all the time. But let's be trite, James. Let's actually look at these opportunities and say, you know what? we can choose the perspective, we can choose the interpretation, we can make a decision that we're not gonna linger and harbor on the sensationalism in the media or, or the evil that we're hearing about. We're going to actually see the good. We're going to shine the light and we're going to take the light that's shone, shone on us and to reflect it back on others. And I think as leaders, as leaders in the household, you know, what sort of role modeling are we doing versus role playing? What are we doing in places, you know, in, in, in corporate America or corporate Canada or corporate anywhere? How are we leading others? What change do we want to see? And I think that's how we solve the problems that we're dealing with today, whether we're talking about racism or 
or, or, or bigotry, or we're talking about differences of opinion, use our differences as strengths. They only encourage us to come up with creative innovation because we may not agree, but we'll agree to find a commonality where we can come up with something better. And I, you know, I think that's the perspective. You talk about your father and how he taught you to speak and the way that you've eloquently been able to channel your voice. And it comes down to taking those experiences, what you and I may think is trite, and to turn it into a story that can impact a person's life. And I, you know, I, I'm sure that's what you have in, in the book right behind you. We are nothing more than a series of stories that we choose to tell and the way that we, the perspective that we adopt can help impact people to hear a story that can inspire them to do good and be better or to feel that they're victimized and they need to fight back in a way that isn't going to help you or I. So I think it's a matter of what can we do differently? What's the perspective that we could adopt? And you know, you and I could definitely continue this conversation. I think we have to bring you back on here. But I'm going to ask you, as as an author, as somebody who's had experience to 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 the, you know, to to the doorsteps of very important and influential people, and in, you know, in your time and mine, what takeaway could you give my listeners today to help them? write a different perspective or adopt a different perspective just to see the good in things? I think it's an attitude. It's a commitment to looking for it. And it's an attitude of gratitude and it's an attitude of curiosity. You know, I don't want to leave this program. I, I absolutely am crazy about you and, and I'd love to talk more with you. And, and I'm sure we will. But I, I don't want to leave this program without mentioning since you are I guess you're Canadian, you're, you're in Canada right now. So about the, the times I've spent with the queen, the queen of, queen of England and uh, how much I learned from her. I mean, I, I'm honored to say that, you know, I had, had many, many times with, with the queen and uh, whenever she talked to me one-on-one, -on -one, she always expressed incredible curiosity. And I wrote an article about that for Business Insider, which still people are, re this was about two years ago, I had, a, I had a, uh, a column called On Leadership on Business Insider. And so I talked about it, it was the most, it blew me away, it was the most read of all of my columns. And I thought, well, you know, because people in America have a fascination with royalty. But the story I was telling was about her curiosity. That's the way she communicated. So I, I think today, especially there are certain groups, I, I will say in the US, but I think it's worldwide, who lack curiosity. And they're kind of what I call wandering the world. They, they have a hard time making connections with people. They're lonely, high suicide rate. Uh, in fact, I've had many of them say to me, oh, how do I, how do I make a relationship in business or socially or personally? And I, I say, well, I will tell you the first step is to be curious, more curious about others than yourself. Well, how do I do that? I'm not really curious. I said, okay, fake it, fake it. Just go up to someone and say, hey, tell me, tell me where you were born. And they were like, really? Yeah, go up, try it. Go up, say, where were you born? And they'll go, oh, well, I work at blah, 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 blah. You know, no, 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 no. Where were you actually born? See, like when, when we were introduced, I wanted to know, where were you really born? Were you mm -hmm. born in Canada? Well, that opened up a whole conversation and that really created a relationship between you and me, right? So I'm trying to say to people that you're fine. It may sound trite to say the love that you give will come back to you. Find ways to express Amen. love. Find ways to save other people. Find ways to be more interested in other people than yourself. But there are also little tactics that you can take to be curious. And to be curious opens up ways where you can, you can do this. And I would say, lastly, that when people say to me, oh, you know, we're so divided. There's so much division, so much division, so much division. Excuse me? You don't know history. You don't know history. You think we're divided today? Absolutely no comparison to the way people have been divided in past, you know, epics or whatever. But I'm going to tell you that we are not divided. That is a fake 
that's a fake and pretentious story. We are all mm. united. We as human beings are all one. I am just as much a brother with you as I am with someone in, in Africa or Asia or whatever it is. We are completely one. We are one of one consciousness. We are one mankind. And we are only divided in the, to the extent that we allow politicians to use us to create power and control for themselves. And I refuse to allow that. I refuse to allow that. Everyone who says to me, oh, we're divided. We are not divided. You know, you're allowing a political movement or, or politicians to make you think we're divided. We are not. We may have different uh, education, different upbringing. We like different food. So what? So what? That makes diversity makes life interesting. Where it is supposed to be a diverse culture, but at the core, we are one and we should be saving each other, not fighting each other. We may come from many different backgrounds, but we form just one nation, humankind. Okay. And, you know, our curiosity is our opportunity to learn to care. It's to dig deeper and it's to find out what really matters. And it's mm -hmm. to learn to adopt the story of another as if it were our own. And that's truly what empathy is. And these are skills that we've always had. And I think, you know, when could I have gotten on a virtual connection with another human being thousands of miles away from me and connected with somebody I did not know before an hour ago? That is possible today. To me, that is not division. That is unity. And that is a story that we need to share and tell that together we unite and we don't need to continue living this false narrative, as you say, that we are divided. So I, I want to leave it there because I, I, I want to leave it with the thought that we can choose to lean in with this curiosity and to care. We can choose to write narratives where we are united and not divided. And I'm so glad that I chose and that you chose today what you had to do over your many other duties that you had to do today. And we know this offline, what you and I were talking about, that this opportunity happened and it wasn't right. It was meant to be, I don't believe in coincidence. You and I were meant to talk today and I look forward to future opportunities to talk to you. And thank you so much. God bless. Thank you for me being my unfiltered guest today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm blessed by it. Thank you. Talk again. Okay. Thank you for listening to Unfiltered, the show about authentic leadership and personal growth. Like what you heard? Click subscribe, share it, and tell a friend about it. And don't forget to leave a rating.